ನಾವು ಫ್ಯಾಷನ್ನ ಬನ್ನಿ ಪಶುಗಳಲ್ಲ ನಾವು ಕೆಲ್ಸದ ಸಮಯದಲ್ಲಿ ಟಾಯ್ಲೆಟ್ಗೆ ಹೋಗೋದ್ರಿಂದ ನಿಮಗೆ ತುಂಬ ತೊಂದರೆ ಅನ್ಸುತ್ತಾ ಹೋಗ್ದೆ ಇರೋ ಥರ ದಿನನಿತ್ಯ ಅವಮಾನ ಮಾಡ್ತಾರೆ ಇದು ಒಂದು ಸಣ್ಣ ಉದಾಹರಣೆ ಅಷ್ಟೇ ಭಾರತದಲ್ಲಿ ಈ ಗಾರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಇಂಡಸ್ಟ್ರಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ಮಗ ಮಹಿಳೆಯರು ಕೆಲಸ ಮಾಡುತ್ತಿದ್ದಾರೆ ನಾನು ಎರಡನೇ ಮಗು ಪ್ರೆಗ್ನೆನ್ಸಲ್ಲಿ ಇರಬೇಕಂದ್ರೆ ಕೆಲಸಕ್ಕೆ ಹೋಗ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೆ ನಾನು ಡಿಲ್ವರಿ ಆಗೋವರೆಗೂ ಕೆಲಸಕ್ಕೆ ಹೋಗ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೆ ಯಾಕೆ ಅಂದರೆ ಕೆಲಸದಿಂದ ತೆಗಿತಾರೆ ಅಂತ ಬಯಕೆ ಅದಕ್ಕೆ ಉಡ್ತೇ ಇರೋ ಮಗುನ ಆರೋಗ್ಯ ನೋಡ್ಕೊಳ್ಳೋಕ್ಕಾಗಿಲ್ಲ ನನಗಾಗಿರೋ ಥರ ಯಾವ ಹೆಣ್ಮಕ್ಳಿಗೂ ಆಗಬಾರ್ದು ನಾವು ಲೀಡರು ಪ್ರತಿದಿನ ನಮ್ಮ ಅಕ್ಕಿಗಾಗಿ ಹೋರಾಡ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೀವಿ ಪ್ರಪಂಚದ ಎಲ್ಲ ಜನರಿಗೆ ಜೀನ್ಸ್ ಮತ್ತು ಟೀ ಶರ್ಟ್ ಒಂದು ಫ್ಯಾಷನ್ ಉಡುಗೆ ಆದರೆ ಇದು ನನ್ನ ಪ್ರತಿದಿನದ ತಲೆಯೂ ಎಲ್ಲಿಯವರೆಗೂ ಒಳ್ಳೆ ಕೆಲಸದ ವಾತಾವರಣ ಸಿಗೋದಿಲ್ವೋ ಅಲ್ಲಿಯವರೆಗೂ ನಮ್ಮ ಹೋರಾಟ ನಿಲ್ಲೋದಿಲ್ಲ ನಾವು ಮ್ಯಾನೇಜ್ಮೆಂಟ್ಗೆ ಹೇಳಕ್ಕೆ ಹೋದಾಗ ಅವ್ರು ಕೇಳಲಿಲ್ಲ ಮತ್ತೆ ವಾಪಸ್ ಬಂದು ನಾವು ಸಂಘಟನೆ ಕಟ್ ಮಾಡ್ಕೊಂಡು ಹೇಳಕ್ಕೆ ಹೋದಾಗ ಕೇಳೋದು ಮಹಿಳೆಯರು ನಿಂತರೆ ಯಾವುದನ್ನು ಆಗಲ್ಲ ಅನ್ನೋ ಒಂದು ಮಾತೇ ಇಲ್ಲ ಏನು ಬೇಕಾದರೂ ಯಾವ ಕ್ಷೇತ್ರದಲ್ಲಿ ಬೇಕಾದರೂ ಸಾಧನೆ ಮಾಡುವಂಥ ಶಕ್ತಿ ಮಹಿಳೆಯರಿಗಿದೆ ಅದು ಆಗುತ್ತೆ Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Goedenavond. I'm very happy to be part of this event because I think it's very important that we talk about these issues. I have to come clean directly. I stand here in front of you and I have a pair of skinny jeans that I probably bought at Hanem because I wanted to buy something quick and easy and cheap. Um, but I'm also wearing uh, a piece that I had my friend made that I can trace back for where it came from. I'm wearing some secondhand shoes. because I like to use things until I feel that they are not needed anymore. And I think awareness is at the root of everything, of any point of change, because if we don't know something's wrong, we don't see the problem, right? So before I came here, I also thought, oh my God, what am I going to wear? And what is that that I'm wearing? And now I should feel guilty or not be guilty, at least be honest about it. Awareness, awareness as the root for change. I was asked to sing something that is in line with what we're talking about tonight. And I was thinking of a song that uh, I wrote after a friend of mine, a journalist in Namibia, actually approached me to write this song, to create awareness about what was happening at the coast of Namibia, which is a um, mining crisis. Basically, it's a very rich country in terms of minerals, and they have uranium mines. And once you mine uranium, you get it out of the ground. It's radioactive for 100,000 years. It goes into everything, into the water, into the sand, into everything we eat, into the air we breathe. And um, nobody knows about it. Nobody's talking about it. And it's held, it's kept that way because people shouldn't know and things should be kept the way they are to keep other people in power. So I think it's very, very important that we're having this event today. I'm very thankful for the programmers that actually put this on the program and everybody who's part of this. The first song I'll do for you tonight is called Clean Country. Mama, they want to put the poison in your blood So they can read the songs and collect the coins Put them in the pocket of some overseas companies Some people will open up their ears, but no, no, no. We want the flowers. 
us to grow, grow, grow. We want fresh water to flow. We want to live in a clean country. No, no, no. We want the flowers to grow, grow, grow. We want fresh water to flow. We want to live in a clean country. Value is only seen in terms of the economy. But what about the food we eat? Seashore, all of that will be no more. Cause they put up fences and borders. Oh, we've got to say it as it is. We've got to say it as it is. Only for the sound of the dollar. Some people will open up their ears. Oh, we've got to say it as it is. Say it as it is. Say it as it is. Only for the sound of the dollar. Some people will open very much Shishani Franks um, if you want to hear more of this I'll um, I'll advise you to listen to her on Spotify because I'm actually a fan of her she doesn't know but I I've been listening to her on on Spotify so please look her up it's uh, amazing uh, music welcome everybody my name is Ama van Danzig I'll be the moderator tonight um, and this is Amelia Fernout and Amelia is here she'll be sewing and she has been sewing, and I think it's important that we have a sewing machine here in the space to really put our minds on what it is that we're talking about. There are people, human beings, who spend hours and hours, and I don't think there are any naked people in the room. Any naked people? None. Uh, all of all the clothes that we're wearing have gone through some sort of a journey before they ended up on our bodies. And that's really something that is quite difficult to fully comprehend and fully understand. Hopefully today we'll be able to together explore a little bit about where our clothes come from, how clean they are, what it takes for them to be made, and honestly the exploitation, the amount of people 
who, uh, not only the amount, but the type of exploitation that takes place for us to wear the clothes that we do. So people who wear, work long hours in unsafe conditions for very little money. But before we go into all of that stuff, I want uh, to thank the people who make this program possible. So Mama Cash, which I think is such a fantastic name, Mama Cash, um, who is the, one of the oldest funds for women and transgender people and helps support people to organize for these kinds of uh, issues. Uh, the National uh, Postcode Loterij, which I'll say just in Dutch, <laughs> um, who funds this, and it's all part of the, um, well, the Clean Clothes campaign is part of this, and it's all part of the Women Power Fashion, probably three of my favorite words, Women Power Fashion Project. So a lot of people came together to make this possible. Uh, wonderful, inspiring activists and researchers are in the room to help us understand. Creative people are in the room. There's, we're going to keep it practical. And I'm really impressed that the room is so full. So is anybody getting nervous? Because I'm going to ask somebody something. And you don't know who you are, but I'm very curious to know why you're all here. Oh, before I let you say anything, I think I should warn you, uh, there's a live streaming. Uh, <laughs> it's all being live streamed, so whatever you say <laughs> will be held against you <laughs> forever. Um, so there's someone wearing a, a t-shirt up there and it says dork. I noticed it when she came in and um, I, I'm a dork myself. So I have to ask you, why are you here? Um, yeah, good question. Uh, actually, because I uh, don't know uh, much about this subject. Well, I know less and I do want to do the right thing, but I don't know where to start. So I hope Great, well, I hope uh, we can help you figure out uh, What the right thing is you quickly looked away. So obviously I should ask you <laughs> Why you're here? Um, because I want to uh, be aware of what I wear and also uh, know where to buy things or you know know a bit more from the background. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you're also looking for whoo, uh, practical tips <laughs> on what to do. Okay. So for a little bit of gender imbalance, I'll ask a man now. Um, and why? Oh, sorry. Why are you here? Um, I've researched it. I've seen main organizations around the world are having um, activism. So I like to see what these people are doing or what you know about it to learn new insights about it. And are you studying this uh, as your job or? I'm starting up um, fashion at Arm in September. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, I really hope that um, I, I believe from the three things that we've heard, we will fulfill all your wishes. I hope the rest of your wishes are in line with these. <laughs> Is anybody else feeling uncomfortable? Then I'll just come to you. You can get it out. <laughs> Okay, so what are we going to do today? We're going to speak to a couple of uh, people who are here. Uh, Zara, Zara Khan is here from Pakistan. We'll talk to her more. Um, we will have a, a mini workshop from the Clean Clothes uh, campaign so to fulfill your wishes on, on practical tips. We'll have a beautiful presentation, a theater presentation or poetry Right? Is that more accurate? Poetry presentation on, uh, so that we can really get embodied into this topic. Um, and I think we're going to have a wonderful time together talking about, about clean clothes and, uh, and whether or not it is clean and the complexity of it because we're the end user and in the end we just want to do the right thing but it's not that straightforward. So without um, much further ado, I would like to invite Sarah Khan to sit here with me at the table. Um, yes, please. You can sit on the second. Please give her indeed. She uh, certainly deserves this warm applause and a lot more. I've read a little bit about Z um, Zara Khan um, before coming here, obviously, because otherwise it would be a bit awkward. Um, and uh, Sarah, you've been doing amazing, amazing work. Sarah is the Secretary General of the Home-Based Women's Workers Federation. And you've been organizing since 2005. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what the situation was when you started? Okay. Uh, the first thing is that the informalization is increasing in Pakistan. Uh, new liberal policies were adopted by our government, especially the military regime in 2000. 
So uh, due to that, uh, our all profitable institutions were sold out and thrown away prices because the privatization policy was introduced in uh, Pakistan. So what it did that uh, the contract system was started uh, in Pakistan. And the main thing is that uh, 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 that uh, was the trade union movement uh, in Pakistan. So in whole, if I will say that the economy become our economy become uh, informalized. So many new uh, sectors was emerging, and the home based sector is one of them. And uh, in Pakistan, we are saying that 12 million are uh, engaged with this uh, sector, and 80 percent, more than 80 percent, are the women uh, workers who do this work at their home for the market. So just just for just for our understanding, you are saying that 12 million women because of the informal uh, sector. 12 million whole. Whole, yeah. And 12 80 million percent, people, yeah. 80 percent of, of that 12 million are yeah. women, yeah. and they make garments at home. Not only the garments, they are engaged with different sectors. Okay. The garment is the bigger one because it includes many things cropping work, uh, uh, embroidery work, um, patch, uh, patchwork. Everything included, stitching even, stitching is also included in that. So it's many, uh, you can say, yes, there is many I, sectors. I, I'm, I'm stopping at this point because okay. um, you're saying they're working at home yeah. doing this. So I think, at least in my mind, right, like the exploitation in the garment se sector, in my head it's happening in factories and there are 12 million people who work at home yeah. doing this. Okay. Yes. So there is a shoe industry as well. Shoes, shoe, shoes are also made in the home. Jewelries, the beadwork on the jewelries that is also in, uh, doing in the home. Even the uh, soccer ball also stitched by the women in, uh, at their home. So there is a different sectors. This is increasing. This, I said that uh, the informalization is increasing. So now the factories, were majority work from shifted from factory to home. So now our homes are used as a factory. And many women are engaged with this, and, and their children also engage with uh, their mother or the elder sisters. And their age is uh, like uh, six to seven years. Since then, they started all the work. So we uh, thought that we have to organize these women because the women number is very high in this. And I thought that uh, I have this faith that uh, if women decide anything, so she can complete that. Uh, till the end because she is honest, she do uh, work very sincerely. So we started work with, to organize these women to start uh, uh, our campaign. Uh, so in 2005 we have, um, uh, we did many meetings and study circles with these women. Uh, then in 2006, uh, 2006 we have established the cooperatives. Uh, cooperative is not the financial cooperative or we make something there, but this is the place where peop uh, the women especially come to sit and discuss their problem, their issues and solve by themselves. So, so what, it's a, who, just because what were those problems? What were those things? The basic they, thing, the basic thing is that uh, regarding the work, because they are not the permanent workers. Right. Like uh, in in a month, they work for uh, ten days, twenty days. So they're not getting the regular work. Even they are not recognized as a worker in Pakistani law. We have the 70, 72 laws regarding the labor, but none of them uh, cover the home-based workers. So that's why we started our campaign, to recognize this, because they, have, uh, uh, they are contributing in the economy, but they are not considered as a labor. If they are not considered as a labor, then it means that uh, you can't form the union. You can't get the benefit of the social, from the social security. So these are the main issues from which we have started our work and we organize all these workers. Then uh, when we uh, established cooperative and when we met with uh, these women, then we get more knowledge about uh, what the problem they are facing in their daily lives. Uh, so that point become our focal point. And we have consulted with many people, many like-minded people that what should we do? Because we have organized these women, but the organization is Organize these women is not the enough because we couldn't get anything from that organization. So we asked, we consulted with many people at that time, even with the like-minded people, NGO, trade, uh, the other people, that what should we do? So many uh, told us, ask us to form the association or uh, NGO or um, you can also form the, uh, register with the Cooperative Act. Uh, but when we met with the trade union, the formal workers trade union, and they give us the different dimensions. And th that was the legal one. 
and we can demand through uh, that legal platform so that is the unionization so where uh, in in any uh, in those sector where we found find, found the relation between the employer and the worker we went for the unionization so we registered three union two union uh, of the embroidery workers one is the glass bangle workers uh, and we have a law in Pakistan that uh, two or more than two um, uh, union can form the federation. So we went for the federation. So in so we uh, in 2008 we have started uh, the unionization process, thinking on that how we will organize them. We prepared all the papers, completed all the papers, and in 2009 we. Uh, September, uh, sorry, in April and in November, we got registered our uh, three unions, three unions with the Labour Department. And then in 2013, December, uh, 2009, sorry, 2009, December, we got registered with the NIRC, it's a National Industrial Relations Commission, who registered the federal, uh, the country level federations. So, so what, what is then the, the uh, advantage of being a part of these cooperatives and being a, a federation now? Yeah, because now we can demand. Yes. Now we can negotiate with the government and with the employer as well. So what, what are the demands, for instance? Like you have to uh, consider us as a labor, and you should also pay the minimum wage to these workers, and should also register these workers with the Social Security Department. So these, these th three points are very main for us. Amazing. I think this is really a, an amazing thing that you've yeah, done. Because, because it's the first ever trade union of home-based worker in Pakistan we have made. So now we are the representative of the home-based workers in Pakistan and uh, uh, our total membership is 4,831 um, and all are the women and uh, led by the women. So we have uh, basically, now we are the part and parcel of the labor movement. Uh, basically, or you can say that uh, now we we uh, give new strength to the weak uh, labor movement in Pakistan because only two to three percent uh, of uh, workers are in, organized in the union. And if I exclude the uh, public sector, so it means it's one point something they are organized uh, in the private sector. And private sector give more jobs. Like uh, if I say that Pakistan is the eighth largest. Um, exporter of the cotton uh, textile products and fourth large, largest um, in the cotton uh, production. Uh, produ uh, cotton, we, uh, at the fo we are f at fourth level on the cotton product, uh, uh, what I will say. <laughs> so actually picking cotton? Yeah, or, picking yeah. cotton or you can say, say this, the finest cotton we have, okay. you can say. So we, we are on the fourth. So it means that we are generate more employment in yeah. this sector because 65 percent uh, economy generate from the textile industry. So it means this sector in employed many, many, many workers, yeah. and but they are not organized. Even in the factory they are not organized because uh, I think I consider that Pakistan is the, one of the main country where the management go to form the unions. Yeah. So it's very difficult to, <laughs> whenever we want to go for the genuine union or for the union registration, so we find that there is a union yeah. registered in the So NIRC the management of the formal yeah. sector, so the, the bosses yeah. register unions, the which make unions. it difficult yeah. for workers to yes. have an actual union. Actual okay. union, or to demand for the workers. Yeah. So that's why we started to uh, hold this work uh, with the home-based workers, and we get this. Are there other home-based worker unions in the world? Uh, in India, I have. Okay. Uh, we have, uh, like Seva. Seva is saying themselves that they are the trade union, okay. and they are working since '72. Okay. All right. And, um, and who who is the most important group that you address your message to? Because you have clear uh, things to demand, very succinct three things that are the top things to demand: better wages, better working conditions, yeah. uh, uh, social security, organization. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so who needs to know this? Everyone, I yeah. think. The Labour Department as well, and the people in the country, our country, and even in the Europe and other countries as well. Because uh, these women and these, uh, those who uh, engage with the home-based sector, they're basically the end of the supply. They come on the bottom of the supply chain. So they work for the international market, for the local market, and for the uh, Gulf countries as well. So they are the part and parcel of uh, the whole supply chain and they are more vulnerable condition, they are working in a more vulnerable condition. Yeah. So we have to talk about these women, these uh, workers, that they have, should, uh, or there should be a law to facilitate them. Yeah. 
Okay, so then, okay, you said everyone. So then maybe we should go around. I am government. What is your message for me? Make the law. Make the law. Okay. Yeah. I am a multinational. What is your message for me? Uh, then I will say that you you are the responsible for whole supply chain. <laughs> oh, okay. I didn't know. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I'm um, responsible. So, you have for the, so what should I do? Uh, when you uh, okay, as a brand, you can do this uh, that uh, if you are taking any merchandise from any country, then you should have to show our list, show your list that from whom you are taking uh, your merchandise. So if you will show publicly or open this publicly so it will be easy to work on this on the whole supply chain right okay okay so now i represent international politics <laughs> <laughs> so i will say that solidarity will make the whole the big change yeah. like in ali enterprise case uh, this factory uh, in 2012 uh, 259 workers were burned alive in yeah. the factory I think you know about this. So f with the solidarity campaign in whole Europe and other country, we get compensation for those workers. It's basically two million. Yeah. And now we did one c case in the Germany as well. So now Kik again uh, uh, come to negotiate and he gave 5.1 million rupees. This is Kik in Germany? Yeah, yeah. Germany. Okay. So this internationally we can do okay so really working together yeah. with other movements internationally yeah. that will really strengthen Support, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Will, yeah okay 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 so we are uh, the thing that we all have in common consumers what should we do uh, then i will say that you have the power then yeah. you have the biggest power i can say this that you are more aware than our consumers so you can put pressure on the brands that they should implement the labor laws at least the labor standard where they are getting their merchandise. Okay, so we should insist yes. that this is happening. Yeah. We have to become more conscious, increasingly conscious, and actually make sure that things uh, hmm. are happening. All right, and now we are also, I see a lot of women here. What, what is it like for you as the head of a women's organization mm -hmm. in, in what is largely a man's world? Uh, it feels good. <laughs> it feels good. <laughs> yes. Is it the power? Or what? Yeah, this is the power. Yeah. Because uh, in one sector, like in Hyderabad, we are working with the glass bangle, work, uh, glass bangle women workers. So uh, the male now are coming to us that uh, you are working with the home based workers, you are working with the women, uh, and we are also facing the same issue. So why you are not organizing? Uh, we uh, as a trade union or okay. you so it's for me it's very good that in male dominant society male come to you and asking for the their organization so it's make me more power yeah okay so you you feel uh, uh, very powerful but is there any other way that uh, gender issues affect your activism because now men come to you for advice mm. but are there other ways that uh, no i don't think so it, you're not affected no because because uh, I because um, uh, I did my masters in gender studies, so I know everything, uh, everything yeah. that what men are doing <laughs> in this world. <laughs> so it's uh, I think my study clear me about these kind of issue. So I am very conscious of, of all these things. Okay. So we are uh, so I am discussing all the things with men. As I am also tr uh, conducted training with the men, the former workers trade union as yeah. well, and training on gender issue as well. So so you know everything. So how do you do, do deal with that? I mean, we are all a lot of us are subject to uh, the dominant hand of men. So how do you how so how do you do it? How do you actually maneuver in a male dominated world? How have you managed to make because I am very focused focus on my subject. So that's why it, the people uh, who deal with me or um, the whom we, I'm talking, they consider that sh she is serious and she do a lot of things for the workers and put and uh, raising the main issue for the workers. So they also uh, take me as a very serious person. Yeah. So that's why I okay. think maybe this issue I can say. But when I started work with the home based workers, so Initially, we feel very difficulty uh, to organize these women because they are living at their home. And uh, in working class community, uh, there is the right based approach always restrict you. Uh, so you can say that the society use the traditions, patriarchal norms, values, and religion 
to stop the women. So initially we uh, felt very problem to organize these women because they, th those women said us, uh, told us that their men and their families are saying that uh, we will sold them to the market. Oh. <laughs> yeah, and S sell the women. Yeah, sell the women oh. to the market anywhere, and uh, even uh, they uh, they said us that uh, their family saying this that uh, we are working for the Jewish organization Jewish. <laughs> yeah because uh, in Pakistan we have some problem with the Jewish <laughs> like with Indians we have <laughs> so uh, I'm happy we can laugh about it <laughs> yeah so they they consider that we are uh, we are lobbying to working for the West agenda yeah so they restrict women to not go or talk with outsiders. Yeah. So initially we f faced this problem, but we overcome uh, this whole issue with our dedicated group. And our group was initially is four and five uh, women yeah. who contacted all the women and then we uh, make their groups. So really the, the way to do it is to stay focused. Yes. Stay focused, make sure your merit is correct and people can really know that what, what you're working on is, your purpose is pure. Yeah. Right? So, well, is that too... Well, yeah, so you the, can say this. Yeah, yeah so you, you're purely doing something, it's clear what you're doing, mm. uh, stay focused and continue doing that. Mm. And that's how you maneuver to, to get ahead, mm. all right. These are tips for the activists here, <laughs> that's how you do it. Okay, but you've done a lot, so what would you say is the, your biggest challenge? What has been your biggest challenge? Uh, since I started the work yes. or right now? I, or Whichever you want to pick. Maybe the biggest now. Okay. Uh, like uh, we started work in 2015, so it's almost 10, more than 10 years. So uh, it uh, create frustration in our leadership uh, that is 10 years, and we didn't get anything from anything uh, anywhere, like financial support from indirectly or indirectly, or uh, we we have the policy. Uh, which is signed uh, last year in 2016. So it gives us hope that n if we will focus and we will raise our voice, then our voices are being heard. Yeah, and so this, this is a big breakthrough, the, right? Yeah. You have a yes. legislation yeah. that actually yes, uh, protects. Not the legislation, but the, we have the policy now. The policy is the basically it's a base yes. to form the legislation, right. to work on the legislation. So now we have the uh, baseline that uh, these workers are considered as a special category because we have the 70 or 72 laws in Pakistan regarding the uh, workers, but none of them con uh, covers the home-based home home uh, workers. workers, home based women workers. Home -based, all the home-based home workers. workers. Okay. We didn't work for the women, we work for the men's oh. as well. Okay. So all, we work for the all. And I'm proud that by saying this that uh, we are the one in Pakistan who raise home based issue as a labor issue, rather to consider only as a gender issue. Okay. And now we get success because yeah. we involve the labor department and now we have the policy and then we are and now we are working on the act as well. Okay. So soon, maybe in two or three weeks, it will be go to the labor uh, labor department, uh, yeah. the law department, and the, then the law department will send it to the national uh, the provincial assembly. Okay, so wait, just to follow, we have a policy yeah. that is at the bottom of this, that's already been, uh, yeah. that's done. done. And now, it's, a act. It's, a, it's an act. Yeah. And now the next step is that it's sent to the provincial level, yeah. and then it becomes a law. Well, a law exactly. Yeah. So you have created a law that yes. protects, wow, that's a really uh, not an easy task. And yes, yeah. so 10 years. There's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, so then and the other good thing is that uh, uh, first time we have included the glass bangle home based workers in the minimum wage at, uh, minimum wage gazette. Glass bangles. So, yeah, glass bangle who are making the yeah. glass bangles. Right, and they are part of this uh, home based workers. Home -based they workers. Are the, yeah, they are come under the. Home How big is the glass bangles group? Uh, we are saying it's uh, six lakh. It's six hundred thousand. Six hundred thousand workers are engaged with this glass bangle industry. Wow. We I never even thought of. The people who make glass bangles. Anybody wearing glass bangles tonight? No? Okay. And the women who engage with this, uh, this um, glass bangle industry, they are very uh, cheap labor, you can say. Uh, in one bunch, there is uh, 375 bangles in one bunch. So we call them, it's a one toda. 
and it takes one and a half hours to complete it and they get only five rupees or eight rupees for that and in whole day they what are is five, what is five to eight rupees five rupees maybe it's cents five, eight cents. cents five or eight cents for 300 375 bangles. 375 bangles and they completed 30 to 40 bunches of the bangles in one day so it's around maybe it's more than 3000 uh, bangles a day and they are getting 100 to 150 rupees and and so how does this legislation change this for them uh, it will uh, first it will change their status then now they are the formal. home base yeah they are the formal workers the second stage will be that they will get the minimum wage yeah minimum wage yeah, yeah. Because now they are not getting the minimum wage. Right. Like the in Pakistan, uh, we have the minimum wage of fourteen thousand rupees. So it's uh, per hour, it's uh, sixty-seven rupees. Okay. And they are getting very less. Yeah. Okay. So they are then formal workers. That means they also have social security. Yes. They'll be on min minimum wage. Is minimum wage the same as a living wage? No. Okay. So minimum not, wage is uh, the first. Yeah, we are not in the living wage uh, level. We just, uh, uh, last year we have started discussion right. on okay. the living wage, but yet we have focus on, our focus is basically on the minimum wage. To formalize these workers first yeah. and then, okay, so then it sounds like that's part of your future plan is yeah. to discuss the, the, the living wage. So what, what else are your plans for the future? Uh, now, uh, the future plan is that uh, we are also uh, fix uh, we are going for to fix the wage for the garment industry workers who engage in the informal industry, like in, in home based workers. So we will uh, survey for survey on this sector, and then we will um, make summary to present the labor secretary to fix their wages. Okay. This is all, uh, th and the other thing is that we have also uh, put the petition in the Senate. Uh, to ratify ILO Convention 177. It's the only convention who discuss about the home-based workers. Okay. Yeah. So we are asking for to our government to sign this. So I have put the uh, petition in the Senate. What does it mean when the government has signed this? Are they then if formalized the, or that they... No. If they will sign the uh, C-177, mm -hmm. so it's mandatory for all the province, they should legislate. They should legislate yeah. what? The law. Okay. Right. Okay, so then the law, the, this supports the law that you've put in place. Yeah. Right. Are we so following we are working, this? We are working on both the level, from upper side and for lower side. Lower side, well. exactly. So lower side, you're organizing people, putting them together, letting them know what their rights yeah. are, and also understanding what the situation is, which is mm. what the surveys are. Mm. And then higher level, you're really pushing uh, laws, policy laws, really pushing the higher level policy makers to ratify things that formalize and protect mm -hmm. these workers. Is yes. this a good summary? Yes, right. that's a good summary. <laughs> okay, wow. Well, I, uh, I would like to ask everybody to give you a big round of applause because what you do is not uh, an easy thing and it doesn't even, uh, don't take it as an offense, but doesn't even sound really sexy, you know? It's, it's just extremely essential, fundamental work that we are not even aware of as, as consumers. So please give uh, Zaira a big round of applause for uh, the amazing work that you do and, and the impact that you have and will have on uh, on at least 12 million people, which is uh, amazing. So thank you so much for that. Um, I would like to invite Jenny Meinheimer, is that your name right? Yeah, uh, to give us a, a, a poetic uh, interlude to help us to really get into the, the experience of people who work in the garment industry. The floor is yours, Jenny. Um, I was asked to um, uh, write some poetry and what I did was I did some research. Mama Cash sent me some documents with stories, anonymized stories of women workers. And I pulled together little pieces of them and made one voice and it, in, into a short poem. Issues. There are issues, concerns, obstacles blocking us, hidden, deep, dark, and crazy issues that reflect on you, issues that resonate in us. Anxious wit and clean analysis you get from your friends, we all got problems. 
You shout to us from within the confines of your hard-won paradise lost. You admonish us. This is your own doing. Just don't surrender. But you have the luxury of choice. We struggle to survive. But we are not just assembly liners waiting for the horn at the end of our shift to switch us on. Rice steamers, mango pickers, fulfillers of other people's wants, needs, and passions. We are just like you, filled with aspiration and dreams for the future. We take our kids to school. We worry about bills. We make dinner just like you. You think of us as sweaty bargains buzzing in basements, sewing other people's pants. But that's not who we are. We are strong. We are women. We are wise. No, we don't surrender. We will not go gently into that good night. Our life is not some poetic metaphor for you to toss around before you dive into Netflix and chill. Our life is raw, real, and yes, ridiculous sometimes. When I cannot take a break to go to the bathroom, that's ridiculous. When I have to work 80 hours a week, but cannot even discuss pay for overtime, that's ludicrous. But I love my life. I love my family, my sisters by blood and by heart. We are women. We are wise. We are strong. Let's take a faraway peek at you, at me, and spy on the normalcy that is life without sacrifice, to be able to worry about the right outfit and not food for your kids or whether you will have a job tomorrow, or a husband that will stay. We are just like you, only different. Only difference is us. Yes, there are issues. We've all got issues, concerns, obstacles, blocking us, hidden, deep and just crazy. Thank you so much, uh, Jenny Meinheimer, who is a writer and an actress, for putting this together in such a creative way, all these testimonials. Thank you also very much for humanizing the discussion that we've been having. So we've talked about organizing from the bottom. We've talked about organizing from the top. And you've now added, really, we're talking about other fellow human beings who really, by the accident of where they were born, are uh, working for next to nothing and also have hopes and dreams and aspirations. So uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I'd like to move on quickly with, uh, with our uh, panel because we have to continue this conversation. I'd like to invite uh, Shika Sethia from Mama Cash, uh, who has also done a study on uh, labor rights. And I would like to invite Isabel Dix from uh, Groen Links, who's also a parliamentarian. Yes, there she is. Um, who uh, used to also have a, a fashion line and, um, and was voted into parliament also by, by popular demand, let's say. So uh, uh, really had, uh, as part of the campaign to, to, to stem on women, to vote for women. Um, <laughs> yeah, it happens, we speak all these languages. Um, to vote for women. She, uh, a lot of people uh, chose to vote for women and she is one of the, the people who I believe is thankful for that uh, feminine choice. Um, so thank you both very much and, uh, for being here. We're going to continue the conversation and be talking more about labor rights and conditions in the garment sector, local politics versus activism, and international politics, and, un and the power of unifying to, to create uh, uh, rights and, and support for people who uh, work very hard to create things that we use quite... Uh, uh, in, a, in a way that we can just kind of dismiss, in a rather dismissive con consumption, I guess. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Um, how, how big is this problem, actually, in the garment industry? Yes, I think you can answer it, Sheik. Oh, is, am I putting your Huge. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> thanks. That's a really good answer. Can we be more specific? <laughs> it's, I mean, it's 
transnational. Yeah. The mm. entire problem is transnational. I think that's what it's not located in a particular country or in a particular mm. factory. This is happening everywhere, mm. and it's all connected to practices that are practiced in different locations, but they're all inter interconnected. So it's very difficult to actually put a number to how many people even work in the garment industry. But I mean, because there are so many invisible hands mm. involved in the process, yeah. some of which, I mean, Zara also mentioned, mm. but uh, we it's very difficult to get a sense of, but it's a very valuable industry, but the value is really at the top tier. That's As where it, yeah. it's captured. So you can see how probably how valuable it is because that's what you measure. <coughs> the cost we have no idea. So, but okay. So let's uh, because we like numbers, right? Numbers help us quantify things, even though sometimes we don't even really understand numbers. But let's try. Um, uh, what what for instance would uh, the wage be of a garment worker in Pakistan? Uh, uh, informal. Uh, the informal. It's. Uh not more than 4,000, 4,500. Okay. What? Per rupees. Per rupees, rupees per, per month. And what is that in dollars approximately? Mm. $40 a month. A now they are getting this, yeah. Now they're getting? This. This, $40. That's the formal wage. No, it's not the formal. That's the informal, it's, exactly. Yeah, All right. It's informal. Okay. Uh, formal, formally, we, we have the minimum wage board, and they are fixed as, uh, as uh, 14,000 rupees. Right. It's, I think, $123. Okay. And then... The uh, euro, I think. Do we know... I, I mean, these are questions that you're not prepared to answer, but do we know approximately what, for instance, Pakistan earns from the garment industry? What is the garment industry worth in Pakistan, approximately? I think it's 65 percent we are earning from the garment industry, like in GDP. Yes, yeah, and in yeah. GDP, uh, the GDP is uh, it's 23 percent. Right, 23 percent of Pakistan's GDP, GDP comes from, from the garment exactly. econ uh, uh, yeah. industry. Yeah. And then within that, a huge number of people are being exploited. Yeah. It's 30 million people who are engaged from uh, cotton field to the very added product from the right. shipment. Okay. No, I'm just trying to get a sense of how huge, because we can't say the number exactly, but maybe we can move on to, the, to another aspect of this, because maybe we don't really understand the mechanisms. How exactly is this working? How, are, how is this exploitation happening? How, or do, uh, can I call it exploit? Yes, right? It's quite clear cut. <laughs> Nothing. Do uh... no, you want to? Yeah, you researched. I'm trying to say how it, it's happening is by, well, the complicity of governments, by the complicity of, well, local power elites of international brands. Uh, it's been done in many ways, but what it's effectively has happened is this long chain of actors between the end consumer and the worker at the very beginning of the chain. So you have multiple levels of subcontracting. It's when you when you buy your jeans from an H&M or a Zara, you're buying a brand that probably does not own its own factories. Mm. It owns it. All it does is design and regulate. Um, it then outsources it to a to a supplier factory, probably in that country, um, where it's going to eventually be selling its products, but sometimes not even that. Depends on where labor is cheap. That factory may not be producing everything. They will, they again subcontract the production to various contractors who then may have, so it's, it's a very, very long chain um, that's involved. And it ends up in people's homes. Yeah. So, so then if, because it sounds like, uh, as, as is usually the case, it's a long chain and it's complicated and it's huge. But then, uh, who who is responsible? Um, is it worth asking who's <laughs> the the people who earn the most from this long chain um, of actors involved, who benefit from the invisibilization of workers involved in this chain, who benefit from the lack of information available to the consumer, um, who decide what information will be released, who decide what the price will be of the product that people buy, who decide on how long it takes somebody to fulfill an order for them. Because all of those decisions then impact what you pay a worker, how, much, how many hours a worker works, um, what sort of materials you use. 
So these are decisions that are taken by these brands. Yeah. They are the ones responsible. So the brands are responsible. Yeah. They choose, they know, they know what is happening. Yeah, and if they don't, they should. They should, exactly. All right. I think that's an important thing to hold on to if, for those of us who want to make the right choice. If they say, I didn't know, well, they should know. All right. So, uh, Shika, you did a study. You mm -hmm. did, um, right? Yes. On three right. cases? Well, my study was uh, three cases were the context in which there were three le uh, legal cases filed with in Europe uh, against garment brands. Uh, and retailers um, who were producing in other countries. So there were cases filed for harms committed in a country outside of the country where the brand was based. But the case study that I focused on, which also Zara mentioned earlier, was the Ali Enterprises fire in Karachi in 2012, um, where the German brand Kik uh, was sourcing almost 70 to 75% of what was produced in that factory. Um, they were they done an audit about uh, and given a certificate, a clear certificate that the factory was fire and uh, fire safe. That, it, that everything, that is, everything okay. is fine, mm -hmm. basically. The German brand themselves had done that. Not audit. themselves. No, no, they had uh, they had also outsourced right. the okay. <laughs> certification mm -hmm. um, to an Italian certification mm -hmm. company called Rina. Um, who was, yeah, anyway, so they issued the certificate 10 days before a fire happened in that place, which is pretty, pretty bleak. And these are European companies involved, so our mm -hmm. idea that European organizations are somehow clean, to use the phrase we're using a lot, is also, it's, it's completely false. Um, uh, 256 Six. workers died. 59. 59 workers died in the fire, many burnt alive because it had just one fire exit, uh, which was blocked. Um, and there was this whole debate on who's actually responsible, who's benefiting from that. Was it, is it the factory owner who is also being held responsible within uh, in Pakistan? There are uh, cases have cases have been filed against him. But also, what, what is the responsibility of Kik towards this? They knew that they were sourcing from this factory. They, they had information about the conditions under which the garments were being produced, considering that the factory had been inspected. Um, so all this was done with awareness. So when something happens, why should they not be held accountable? So what happened to them in this case? Uh, the case is still ongoing. It's okay. been accepted in German courts. But how can this be an ongoing case? It's, when I hear it from you, it sounds like quite a clear cut. For me. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and for many people. But often that's not how... It it's becomes very complicated because it's uh, a company being held accountable for acts in a jurisdiction. Uh, so there are issues of sovereignty. This happened, the crime happened, crime happened in Pakistan. Uh, whereas the company is based in Germany. Yes. So who, where do you hold the organization accountable? Is it in Germany? Is it in Pakistan? So there's a lot of legal complications, even though the moral sort of argument seems fairly clear. Yeah. Okay. And then, so you focused on this kick uh, case. Are there other cases? There are other cases. There's, there was one against Lidl, yeah. um, also a German retailer. Um, and that was, I, I think we discussed this also before, was that um, it was filed, uh, there was a consumer protection case filed against Little um, because they, in, they used the phrasing in their advertising and promotional material that they, their supply chain was uh, fully compliant uh, with relevant laws and standards. Whereas it was found by people on the ground in Bangladesh that this was not the case. Um, so the route taken, which was the only feasible legal route at that time uh, was that a consumer protection case that you were basically engaging in false advertising. So the complaint, the, the promotional material was withdrawn, so the case did not go ahead, but also it didn't actually have, I, it's hard to say whether it had an impact on the workers' conditions because of the way it was framed, which is why international action that is, does take place um, at a geographical distance, sometimes also a political distance from where you're trying to look, where the problem is located, needs to be very closely linked to what the problem needs to be, like the discourses need to be similar 
if it's a false advertising case, how does that relate to what the workers are experiencing? Right. And that makes it very complicated. So that's, that's a lesson to be learned from this particular case. That what are you trying to change and the means that you're using, right. do they actually address the, this particular problem or do they do something that, okay, a legal precedent was set, some, yeah. some, the company was held accountable, yes, those are wins, but did you change anything for the people who are ex actually experiencing the harm that you're talking about? And is, is it difficult to change things for the people who are harmed? in terms of wages or in terms, is it is it difficult or is it really just the well just is it really the outsourcing mechanism that makes it that makes us in the situation that we are now i think it's difficult okay. because there are very powerful interests um, trying to block these things from happening they profit from the harms that are being committed so these are not incidental these are not things that are um, unintentional yeah, it's systematic and it's, intentional. Yes. So also countering those sort of those powers is quite difficult. Um, and that's where organizing plays a very, yeah. very important role. A single voice is not as effective as an organized body yeah. speaking for itself. So, and what would you say is the role then of the Home-Based Women Workers Federation in a situation like this? Or these cases that you've studied? Their role... <laughs> um, it's or you, or maybe you. Yeah, I, 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 in these cases. Yeah, I think in Ali Enterprise case, our federation, all women were involved since first day. Like uh, it's happened in 11th September, and on 12th September, we all are on the roads, to demanding the safety at all the workplaces. Right. So since then, our home-based workers are engaged with this whole case. Uh, and women are also, uh, uh, because we are the informal trade union, uh, because uh, we are working with the home-based workers. Right. So, um, but they are involved with each and every <laughs> cases. Like as I said that we have given a new strength to the weak labor movement. So it's encouraging for them, the formal workers trade union, that the home-based workers, ladies are joining their, all the rallies and all, the, all these things. Yeah. So we are engaged with this, uh, uh, with this, uh, because I did one uh, survey uh, when the fire happened. Yeah. So I have uh, interviewed 101 people uh, from the area that what happened there and what the situation in the factory. So we have published that report as well. Okay. Great. So, so you are really representing and organizing also around these cases that. Yeah. Uh, so really so important. we have yeah we have filed uh, the case in like Shika said uh, four worker case in the in uh, in Germany German court uh, in the name of um, pain and suffering and even we are uh, planning to uh, sue a case to Rena company as well. Okay, yeah. and Rena company is the is Italian. A, yeah, is an Italian company and is an audit company and he's certified 99 factories in Pakistan and they are not telling us <laughs> to whom they are giving the okay. certificate. Are we following this? Is everybody okay? We're together? Okay. No, sleeping. No, uh, you're not sleeping. I see, I see eyes blinking. So. <laughs> All right. Okay, thank you. Thank you both very much for this. For, I, I do find it quite complex indeed, this system of outsourcing, uh, this system of, uh, up, you know, the, for instance, this case with Lidl it was, that, uh, you know, they've filed the case in such a way that they dealt with it in terms of advertising advertising in a, in a way as though they're doing something, but they didn't actually have an impact on the workers, which is also an important lesson in how we organize and how we uh, uh, really try to seek justice. It needs to go a little bit deeper and also really understanding what the context is that, that all of this uh, is happening in. So thank, thank you very much for helping us yeah. start Can I to... comment on this? Yes, because please of do. Course yeah. I gave her the floor because she has done so much research yeah. about it. But I would like to comment on this because I'm um, fully aware, of course, that what um, those clothing companies are doing is um, perhaps even inhumane. Um, and it's violating all kinds of uh, rights, women's rights, um, labor rights, all kinds of rights. But I do think that there is also um, um, a responsibility of consumers and 
Because everybody in the Netherlands or every, any other country should realize that if you are going to a shop and you can buy, I don't know, a t-shirt or whatever for three euros and it's made on the other side of the world, we have, um, uh, there is used so much cotton, so much water, uh, we have to transport it. So many hands have had this t-shirt and you can buy it in the Netherlands or in Europe for three euros, then you must understand that someone is paying the other half. And, <laughs> yeah, because I do think, because as a consumer you can say, I, I can't help it, it's, uh, been, uh, it's brought to me in a shop and I was just there and I'm completely innocent, but you're not. I don't think that you're innocent, you should understand that um, there is no such thing as free lunch. And if you buy, um, uh, you can understand that those low prices are completely um, unacceptable. Um, so I would say there is a shared responsibility, of course, of those uh, um, uh, <laughs> clothes uh, uh, producers that just violate all those rights everywhere in so many places in the world. But we can do something too. You don't have to buy that T-shirt. You don't have to buy that uh, dress of, in most um, circumstances, also low quality. And if you buy low quality clothes, they just, sometimes you just buy rags. If you wash them two or three times, it's almost a rag. I don't want to um, insult you in any way. Mm -hmm. but. The, the quality of this cotton and the, the quality of the uh, fabrication of it is sometimes so poor that you almost digest these clothes. You cannot, um, they don't last even for a few seasons. So when you look at it um, from an environmental perspective, it's very enhancing of um, the use of so much um, um, oh, I forgot the word, resources. So we use so much cotton, so much um, uh, oil, water, all those very uh, scarce and sometimes um, uh, resources that we, this is not the way to restore, I would say, um, uh, or to, to develop to, uh, towards a kind of circular economy. So um, this, is, this is for me, or my Green Left Party, another reason, besides all those labor rights, of course, um, uh, very uh, important, but it, there's also an environmental impact mm -hmm. to this kind of uh, production. So that's my... Yeah, thank you so much uh, for that very important um, submission. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because it's a different kind of aspect, but it's, yeah. it's actually quite Well, I mean, I it's just uh, indeed obvious, you know, why, why sh well, how it could yeah. a t-shirt cost three euros of or course. less? Um, well, it's, it's not, somebody yeah. has to be yeah. paying, Someone's indeed. Paying. Um, um, Isabel Dix, you're from the Green Left Party, and you have a very special motto, yeah. I understood. <laughs> Yeah, there are so many languages here tonight, but I come from Friesland, which is a part of um, uh, this guy. I don't speak Frisian, of course, oh. but only a few words. But my, um, the Frisian languages uh, and Frisian culture, in my uh, opinion, are very um, poetic. I can't, where, oh yeah, there you are, very poetic. Mm -hmm. um, my motto is, Wolle is kinne. And um, I think this is of, um, it inspires me, or there are some Frisians in the, in the audience. Uh, it inspires me every day because um, what it actually means is if you want to do something, you can. And you are um, the embodiment of this uh, motto, I would say, because you saw something and you wanted to change it and you did, or you're doing this. So I'm very uh, impressed by you. And, yeah. I hope that we can be of any assistance in your um, battle. Because, because that brings me to, to another, I really like that you talk about this in, in such an a passion, impassioned way. Um, um, but what do you think is then the role of international politics? Were you a politician? Mm -hmm. Yeah, last week the European Parliament um, accepted a resolution 
to actually do something about this situation and the, the freedoms almost that these clothing companies have. So they tr want to try to regulate it now. In the Netherlands we have this covenant, uh, clean clothes and textiles, but it's not effective or not very effective um, because it's too, um, um, there was no money to um, uh, install this uh, covenant or to do something. And it was supposed to be um, uh, a secretariat. There was no money. And when you think that Walmart used to be, I don't know, Walmart, Shell, those kind of companies, are the 10 biggest companies in the world. That's how they do it. This is how they get so rich. If you leave all those external costs like environmental costs, all those labor wages. If you don't pay them, of course you get the biggest, com biggest company in the world. So we try to, um, uh, to change that, of course. Uh, the European Parliament is going to do this uh, as of uh, last week, uh, last Thursday. And in the Netherlands, I'm uh, very um, uh, inspired to do the same and to try not only to ask companies um, to change this, but to actually um, uh, go to work and really change this, um, perhaps first voluntarily, but um, yeah, then we have to make regulation because you, there is, this is not an accept, you, we cannot accept this any longer, this kind of situation. What you tell us about these glass uh, bangles, this is, we just sit here and we just hear it, but this is ridiculous, this situation. So we do have to to try, at least try and change this. And, and, uh, and we, we do, are trying, right? With well, there is a covenant, but as I said, it's not very effective. No. There are so many um, companies that, that just evade this problem. And yeah, as you um, explained already, because um, sometimes uh, those companies um, uh, have a production facility in uh, Bangladesh or Pakistan or uh, any other country, but those um, uh, uh, companies or those uh, production facilities just set out their um, uh, questions uh, home-based. So where, how can we see what happens beyond? Uh, beyond those production facilities. So, because the, the, there's a part of it that is the, the companies, so mm -hmm. the, the convention mm -hmm. now is talking about these international companies. Mm -hmm. So, do you think that uh, international governments can put pressure or should put pressure on local governments? Because it, we've also understood that part of the problem is at a local yeah. government level. Yeah, in, in Pakistan or yeah. country. Yeah. Um, I, I don't, I'm not that, um, how shall I put this in English, I don't know that uh, uh, enough of the situation in Pakistan to say how to organize the Pakistan uh, way of leg legislation. I just don't know that, I'm no. sorry. Um, but of course, um, if we try to regulate this uh, situation, um, if there is no um, uh, demand, then the supply will just uh, diminish. So if the demand uh, becomes more fair, um, the uh, supply uh, should become more fair because yeah. this is all um, part of, of agreements that we make and of treaties that we make. So we can try to um, work this um, uh, aspects in those new treaties. Do you want to say something, Sam? I think I found only one way yeah. <laughs> to, come, to overcome all this situation because a tripartite mechanism is very f weak field because what is the tripartite mechanism? tripartite mechanism is like um, the employer representative worker representative mm -hmm. and the government representative right. okay. so it's a tripartite mechanism mm -hmm. uh, so it's failed in pakistan because uh, whenever we have a meeting uh, we call a meeting then employer are reluctant to come in this yeah. meeting they just send their admin people and uh, their hr manager so they can't take any decision on behalf of the uh, um, uh, their employer so this is the issue which we are facing in uh, pakistan the second issue is that the employers are very powerful they have the money they have the guns they have the all resources and they also have the link with the power circles and the brand are also least concerned about the whole supply chain yes. yeah yeah we have, the, uh, we have many uh, covenants, convention, even ILO convention. I think Pakistan has signed many conventions, yeah. 34 conventions, but there is no implementation, even the basic core uh, right of the unionization and collective bargaining. So I think I found only one way which 
I think I consider it's a very important that uh, now we need uh, uh, now we need the strong you can say strong organized and concerned labor movement. Right. Mm. Then it will make the change. The bottom. Yeah. So locally. Exactly. Organized people. It, yeah. Locally mm. and. Even nationally as well. Yeah. Because okay. I think you people are also facing the problems. Right. Regarding yeah. minimum wage or regarding mm -hmm. the other thing, the austerity, austerity plan uh, is in Germany. L but I think it's a labor movement. If they will be strong and strengthen, then we will achieve everything. Yeah. Because you, are see, you see that the production is the collective, but the money goes on one hand right. or the few hands. Yeah. So if production is product uh, collective then why should the distribution is collective mm -hmm. so we should have a strong powerful labor movement we need this now yeah, yeah. so we can change make the change yeah. so this can be uh, perhaps part of a uh, of a certain treaties international trade tr treaties uh, for instance in which we can um, try to uh, bring this kind of aspects again um, uh, on the table Right. Yeah. Yeah. But GSP plus is the main, um, the good thing if you can raise this voice. GS uh, GSP plus is a status which uh, we have got uh, in 2014, I Who's think. We? Sorry. We, the country? Pakistan. Or the, okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> we means, sorry, right. country, <laughs> Pakistan. So uh, we have uh, margin of uh, tax free, some of the tax free uh, material we will sell to the European market. So in uh, GSP plus we have that um, 28 labor laws and human rights laws, but they are not implementing right. anywhere. So I think European Union can Pressure. force, yeah, pressurize our government that you should follow all these laws. Yeah. The European Union. The European should, Union can, can the parliament, yeah. The Pakistani government. Yeah. Do you, you agree with this? Yeah, because they try to regulate this yeah, because of the decision that was made uh, last week. And I think it's also uh, very um, wise that the European Union as a whole tries to uh, organize this in a more um, uh, or in a better way, because now we have 28 different kinds of treaties or 28 different kinds of ways how to deal right. with this uh, uh, certain, of this special uh, situation. Yeah. So it's better if the entire uh, European Union as a whole tries to regulate this. Mm. Yeah. The basic thing is the implementation. Yeah. 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 From so which we are yeah. lacking, yeah. So yeah. everybody seems to sign things quite easily yeah. and then we yeah. don't do anything with yeah. it. So, so you you this is yes this is a point of discussion yeah. it seems. Yeah. yeah. So I'd like to say something but um, so this is yes the european uh, well the european bodies should probably try and influence the pakistani government or the indian government uh, as much as possible but this what zara said about labor organizing and demanding things is very vital because this is not a problem of pakistan yes. of bangladesh of of India is a global or issue. Sri Lanka. Yeah. There are also labor issues mm. in the Netherlands, in mm -hmm. Germany. Mm -hmm. So it's about the people who are affected bringing their voice, mm. us hearing that and responding to it wherever it is and whatever mechanisms need to be. So it's not also selective hearing of what is happening in countries like India and Pakistan because that's easy to think about, yeah. but also what's happening here at home. And linking those things is quite quite critical to actually demanding change that is lasting. Right. Okay. Okay. So uh, yes, let's pressure uh, local governments, but let's not pretend that there are no problems here. And let's link these movements. Let's create yeah. international solidarity. Yeah. Is that what we're we're yeah. saying? Yep. Okay. Yeah. The trade union and the, all the human rights organizations should come yeah. together right. to fight against this. We're all going to come together. <laughs> to, well, please, huh? Yeah. Well, okay. So if we're talking about organizing, uh, Isabel Dix, you, as I mentioned earlier, are a beneficiary, let's say, of a certain type of activism, right? So there was a movement here in the Netherlands. Every most people here are Dutch, and we're aware that we recently voted. <laughs> <laughs> so and there was the uh, a campaign to vote mm -hmm. for women. Yeah. And you are a beneficiary of this, so you are actually yeah. in the parliament. A lot of because people of voted this. for you as a woman, yeah. and now yeah. you are representing women yeah. in parliament. What do you think of this type of activism? 
Well, actually, it's quite difficult, um, or it's um, it, perhaps my feelings are a bit mixed about it because um, I was um, uh, placed at place 19 on our list, and we had 14 seats in uh, in Parliament. So when we had um, the election day, uh, and I heard the the result, I thought, well, okay, I'm not in it. Well, too bad. Two days later, um, I was um, suddenly a member of parliament, and um, fortunately, to be honest, uh, number 14, a woman, also um, had uh, extra votes. Because if she didn't, I would have replaced her, which was not actually the idea of the, um, uh, this uh, certain uh, action. Um, so then we just, um, um, yeah, uh, a man had to move. Um, well, he was sad, and he was actually very capable to become a member of parliament, so it, it, it's mixed also for me. But um, it's difficult if you are um, put in a place, well, almost just because you're a woman. That's, I do hope that I am capable of more than just being a woman. Yeah. Um, um, actually, I've been active for my party for 23 years already on all kinds of levels. I've been a vice mayor for eight years. I've been a member of a city council, a provincial council. So I have earned more or less um, um, yeah, this a bit uh, within my party. Um, so I, I, I had 28,000 uh, votes, which is really um, a hysterical uh, amount uh, in the Netherlands. Um, so I'm very proud of it, but it, uh, as I said, it, it feels a bit mixed, to yeah. be honest. Yeah. But do you feel, uh, and watch out, there are a lot of women here, but do you feel pressured to do more for women because you know that you got these votes mm -hmm. uh, because of... Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, I always have such um, different answers, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I don't think that because I'm a woman, I have to be uh, busy with women's things. Um, uh, I, I don't think if you come from, I don't know, Suriname, that you have to be uh, interested, especially in Suriname or when you're from Turkey or in Turkey things. I don't, um, I don't see it that way. I'm Turkey things, which I really strange. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's actually okay, I think. Yeah. Um, so. Um, but it's, it's, it's a bit of a pressure, to be honest. I'm just thinking about the answer. Um, it's a bit of a pressure. And of course, um, I'm interested, uh, as you have heard, hopefully, in uh, especially in women's and children's rights and um, uh, democracy and things like that, development, international development. I've studied um, international relations uh, years ago. So these, the way we have organized the world is something that interests me. And um, uh, women are, uh, of course, a half of that or even a bit more. So there is all reason, um, of, uh, enough reason to be inspired just by the, the actions that we can take as we sit here. Um, but only to be um, interested in women's um, uh, aspects, that would be a bit too small for me. But it's more than half. So yes, it's a bit more than half. Yeah, but it's bigger than that. Women right. are everywhere. To put exactly. It like, and women's aspects are in every aspect Everything. of our lives. So. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, please stay seated. I would like. Uh, we're a little bit behind schedule, but I would like to make this a little bit more practical. Is everybody okay? Yes, good. A little bit of murmuring means you're awake and you're doing fine. Um, so we've had a, a really lovely discussion about organizing from a local level, from an upper level, uh, so a governmental level, also internationally what is being done. And we've also looked at ourselves as, the, as Europe and as the Netherlands and how we can impact it and ourselves as consumers and how we can impact it. But I think a lot of us might want to know a little bit more about the consumer uh, side of things. So I'd like to invite Suzanne um, from Clean Clothes Campaign to give us a mini workshop. Please give her a round of applause. Thank you. Um, well, before going into the, the practical uh, mini workshop, I would just like to explain uh, very briefly um, the, the Women Power Fashion uh, campaign, of which um, Clean Clothes Campaign and Mama Cash have, have launched, and also why 
myself and Isabel are wearing these um, ties with what Women Power Fashion uh, on it. Um, right now, what we do within this Women Power Fashion campaign is on the one hand um, support uh, workers in production countries. We make them aware of, um, of their rights and how they can organize themselves and we link them to um, international organizations and um, like international solidarity that was already uh, talked about. And um, so this is one part of the uh, Women Power Fashion campaign and the other part of it is awareness raising uh, among consumers and that's what we're especially doing uh, this week. Um, we this morning just opened a, um, uh, a sweatshop, a uh, mini sweatshop in The Hague where um, volunteers are um, sewing these ties um, all day in shifts of two hours. There's about 150 volunteers uh, there this week and we also asked um, uh, Dutch celebrities and politicians to join us to raise awareness towards consumers but also towards brands and politicians on this this huge um, problem and to um, ask for for um, improvement um, so yeah that's that's the story behind these uh, ties and if you're interested then of course please come by uh, this week to um, to see for yourself the, um, the mini sweatshop. Um, so, something that was already addressed um, during uh, the discussions, it's very important to know um, who, where, where our clothes are being made. And with where, I don't mean in which country, because we do know that the majority of our clothes are being produced in countries like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Cambodia, uh, Myanmar. Um, yet we don't know in which factories they are being produced, because this is simply um, not being, uh, this, this is not transparent. There is a couple of brands that do um, actually show which, which factories they are uh, producing their clothes in, like for instance CNA and um, G-Star have starting to, started to um, um, publish the, the uh, production locations, but the great majority of the brands do not do so, and this is really essential for um, um, both uh, consumers here because you have the right to know under what kind of conditions your clothes were being made in in which particular factory but it's also important for the women working in uh, the production countries because they also have the right to know for which brands they are producing uh, their clothes because uh, like it was talked about already there's a great responsibility with these brands and um, if the factory owners uh, don't listen then via um, women's movements or via trade unions, these workers should be able to address the brands about the problems that they're facing in these factories when it comes to safety, when it comes to um, the, the uh, wages that they're earning that are not enough to support their families. So it's, it's very um, important to know and therefore, a first thing that you could do, and that we're raising a lot of attention around this week, is to um, sign a petition and, uh, on the Women Power Fashion uh, website, which is womenpowerfashion.nl. You can uh, sign this petition, and um, this petition is part of a, of a larger international um, campaign on uh, raising awareness around the importance of transparency and pledging for brands to actually publish the locations of their factories. Um, so that would be a great help if we could uh, gather as, much, as many signatures as possible and uh, hand over these, um, these petitions to CAOs to, um, to ask for um, more transparency. And then what, what is it that you can do yourselves um, as a consumer to raise awareness and to show brands why you think this is so um, important? Um, you can simply ask questions. If you go to a shop and you buy a new t-shirt or a new jeans, then 
at the cashier ask, like, do you know where this is, has been produced, in, in, in which factory, and what were the conditions? Because I think when we unite as consumers and when um, within shops the, the personnel notices that there's more and more awareness and, and consumers do want to know where their clothes are being produced, then eventually this will uh, be addressed also at the management level and um, you, you can even notice it uh, already, I find. Like, I, I always ask and um, the personnel does know more and more about, for instance, this, this Dutch confidence that has been signed. They know that their brand has signed it. And so I think we do see a little bit more awareness there. Um, we've also brought cards here today that give some example questions of how you can phrase your questions. Um, and then, of course, there is uh, social media nowadays, and all of the brands have their social media accounts as well. So um, to make it even more visible, you could um, take a picture of your new outfit and ask um, H&M, CNA only these sort of questions, like, okay, who made my t-shirt, and did she earn a living wage, was she um, working in a safe factory, was she allowed to join a labor union? These sort of questions you can address directly and um, when more of us make it a uh, common thing to do after we buy something, they will, um, they will, the brands will experience that um, this is important and they will um, take it up more. And if you do, then please, um, uh, use the hashtag women power fashion and um, I don't know maybe maybe you have Twitter accounts and you're you know you have your cell phone with you we could even do it right now and um, see which you know I don't know wh what is your favorite brand or uh, the the brand that you're wearing today just you know address them with one of these questions and um, let's let's show them that we are uh, aware of the um, uh, of the problems and that we want to change. Yes, maybe because um, I have the Twitter wall. It was an, um, like at the particular brand you're wearing and then you could for instance ask, ask who made this t-shirt? Um, did she earn a living wage? Or uh, was she able to join a, a labor union? Because this is often very difficult. Um, was she uh, working in a safe factory? These particular practical questions. There are some people already. Uh... Hashtag. Hashtag women power fashion. There's also some pictures of the mini sweatshop today. There we go. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. And keep, keep this going. This is digital, mm -hmm. but is there something we could really share, like a card you have that you can give out in the shop with your questions? I think it's, I think you know, it's, it's and, and we have also a have a Women Power Fashion um, card as well that we were handing out the yeah, mini but sweatshop. It's a card, so if people are not here, they don't have the card. So is yeah, there an option to print it, you know, at home or something like that? Um, well, on on our website, there is a, there's also a tool where you can um, ask this on schoneklieren.nl but um, and it's actually printed I'm not yeah. sure where you can actually print it from our website but this that is something we can think about and also to share it on Facebook and stuff you know like the, the yeah yeah that's a good idea yeah the, on our website we have to, that's what I said we have the digital cards but the, I'm not sure whether you can print them but yeah ah okay so apparently you can actually print them, yeah. Yeah, 
Yeah, but on our website they're also visible and you can print them. Okay, um, so if you're a bit shy to do it now, do and, it in an hour. And then um, we always got these questions, of course, like where can we buy sustainable, clean clothes? And I think this is a, a quite a difficult question also for us to answer um, because uh, we do want to address the bigger brands because if we want change in the garment industry, we need to address the H&M and we need to address the CNAs in this world. And um, of course, it's it's very good to um, uh, ask for you know wh which which brands are more sustainable and where can we safely buy clean clothes. But I think we should also um, keep addressing the bigger brands to to change. Um, so, but if you, um, if we got, get these questions, the answers that we can give is, for instance, take a look at the uh, Fair Wear Foundation. This is a, a foundation that brands can uh, become a member of, and then they, um, they are being supported to take steps when it comes to um, the um, living wages, uh, more transparency, safer factories. Uh, so you can look at the Fairware Foundation website to see which brands are um, a member of uh, Fairware. Then in the Netherlands we have this Rank a Brand website and they, um, they look at all of the audit systems and make evaluation of which um, uh, brands are doing better in terms of um, uh, providing the information on audits than others. Um, and there is this app Talking Dress, which also gives um, uh, ideas, of, uh, gives uh, examples of sustainable brands. But there, I mean, brands are never 100% clean, unfortunately. Um, and then, of course, there's uh, the second-hand clothes and, and having exchange or swapping parties with one another uh, to, um, to make sure that the clothes that you are not wearing anymore and are still fine are still being, um, can still be worn by, by your friend or someone else who might um, like it still. So these are some practical um, examples. Then I had the, uh, as a final slide, the um, YouTube clip, but it was also shown when we came in. So I think most of you have already seen it. It's what women themselves in production countries do. So this is it for the practical um, tips. I don't know whether I should address any questions now or afterwards. So uh, thank you very much. Can I please have a round of applause? <laughs>
But as I've said, we have as consumers also the responsibility. So I think there is a shared responsibility because you have to understand that it's impossible to buy these kind of cheap clothes. Yeah. In, in effect, it's not real. It's almost virtual. Um, and it's what you say, um, uh, Zira, it's, it's capitalism. This is the nasty phase of capitalism. Our, um, so we have to uh, be more aware of, that. I, I, of this. I think that um, awareness is also uh, very important. So the questions uh, that you can ask in, in the shop are very helpful, perhaps, also for people um, in, Western, uh, part, in the Western part of the world to be more aware of this situation and not to just accept what is uh, shown to you um, uh, in stores and just to buy it because it's there but also to understand that you have power as a consumer too. Yeah. Mm. Well, thank you very much. So it's back, the ball has been sent back to you. Um, is there a, a mic? Yes. Um, the ball is back in your court, consumers, citizens. Um, I think now is the time that you are, will entertain a few questions for the, for the panel at this point because you've, you've done a great job listening for quite a while. So. For those of you who have thoughts that you want to air out of your mouth, it's ready. <coughs> Hello. Uh, as a beginning fashion designer, I would like to know which companies you uh, advise me to go to for uh, big production. Well, that's a very practical uh, question. Is it directed at any particular person on the panel? The so who should she go to? She's starting her company. Wow. Mm. Who should she go to for her production? Who is a fair person who is not, which company is fair, is not exploiting anyone? She wants to do the right thing. In order to, to produce these clothes yes. or to sell them to? To produce, oh, to mass produce. production. Yeah, mass production. Yeah, she wants to do mass production. So which company you yeah. want to? So in Pakistan. So who, who should she go to in Pakistan to, who is doing the right thing in Pakistan? I think workers. <laughs> workers. You should go to the workers, the okay. trade union body, the genuine trade union body, <laughs> so they can suggest you. Okay. Maybe. But not, I can't say regarding any brand because they are violating. The air. Yeah. Go ahead. There is no link or a page I can, I can search for that gives me more advice about it, maybe? It's Unfortunately, not that simple. Exactly. Also, not everyone is as connected or using internet the same way. So it does require a lot more effort to find out who's actually producing mm. things fairly. And mm. also often information that you receive on the internet is also mediated through the politics of where you read it, uh, who's presenting it to you. So I mean, there's really no replacement for you finding out as much as possible based on what your own moral sort of um, base is to see what, who's, who can produce those uh, garments for you if you have certain conditions that you wish to be met, find a way for those to be met, reward somebody for doing those things, uh, make sure that they feel that they also set the terms that they work uh, that they work on the basis of, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, it sounds, very, it's very easy. <laughs> Maybe shortly responding to this question, like I, I would say address some of the brands um, that are doing better, like we'll take for instance look at the Benka brand website and address the uh, companies that are doing more already and see what kind of problems they en encounter when wanting to be sustainable um, and yeah, share experiences with them and learn, learn from them which steps to take when you want to be as, more, as sustainable as possible. Yeah, yeah, be, but yeah, there's uh, yeah, where to start. Eh? So, yeah, and someone's saying travel to the factory, go and see what's happening there. Someone at the, oh well, go ahead. There's one here and there's... Uh, well, oh. Thank you very much for your talks. Um, I was wondering, uh, Mrs. Dix, you mentioned that the consumer has a big role, um, but I was also wondering if the government will guide us to uh, make the good choices in terms of private standard setting, for example, uh, which ones are the 
most trustworthy ones, which ones uh, you should actually choose, and um, yeah. So what do you think? Yes, well, this might be a good idea just to, to, to take the consumer by the hand, more or less. Uh, I don't know this, of whether this is something that my party uh, especially would, would try to, to organize because it's also a bit patronizing. Um, I don't know, um, but it might be helpful because I was um, uh, thinking a bit about this website you said. Uh, perhaps we can um, um, organize or help people organize to make a website or to give information about what is right to do, uh, perhaps uh, in cooperation with the Clean Clothes uh, uh, campaign, um, to, to um, yeah, more or less again, uh, take the consumer by the hand and to, to lead him or her a bit through this um, minefield of buying clothes more. Eh? If, you, if you try to do the, the right thing, it's very difficult to be um, informed or to get informed. So we might be able to uh, talk about this or to organize in some kind of way. So it would be, um, if you want to, to talk about that or you want to organize this, I would be uh, helpful. Okay, so we're willing to make a website, but we're not willing to be patronizing as a government. Are there more questions? Uh, oh, here, okay, sorry. I'm not gonna, well, I, I would li like to add something that, yeah. uh, in a way, it's also a class thing, because a single, single mother yeah. with five kids yeah. is glad when a t-shirt is three euros. Yeah. And it's, you know, we are fortunate to, yeah. to be able to think about yeah. the choice. But if you have no money, who am I to tell you, you know, I understand the problem, but it works. Yeah. So the people who are poor here are also a victim. So we shouldn't forget that. It's yeah. not always just a single choice. I think that's a, a really important, uh, really important core issue here. That, you know, it's, it, that's I think also what you've been trying to say is also how complex it is. There's a, a question there, people leaving. Thank you very yes. much for coming. Okay. Yeah, thank you too. Um, what I would like to address is, um, we're talking about the who is the problem here, but I'm hearing very little solutions. Um, and I believe a lot of solutions can be made in startups, in innovations that do things differently. Um, so for instance, my company is a marketplace that promotes secondhand um, nice clothes. So what we want to do is make people very aware to invest in quality because quality that lasts and um, it has value and then you buy it second hand and then you don't buy this very cheap fast fashion thing. So um, let's also not forget innovation and startups because there's a lot of hope there. What's the um, name of your company? It's called The Next Closet. Um, and then again a challenge which also comes to your challenge because our um, how we select the clothes that we allow on our marketplace is that we say it has to be of a designer brand because we say designer brand has value. So we say, for instance, um, so where is the barrier of quality? That's actually my question. So we don't allow Zara, Zara, H&M and CNA on our platform because it's a fast fashion brand. But we do allow, for instance, um, Philippa K or Karen Millen on it. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually not really sure if that is so much better. And then you say when you are in a shop and something costs three euros and then it makes you think, hey, this is the same price as a cappuccino, so okay, not buy it. But there is very little there for even me as a startup or for the consumers to know, um, yeah, when, when is something quality and when do we um, consciously say it's okay to buy this? right now. So if there is anything, anybody who knows something about it to help, I would be very interested to hear that. Okay, I think we'll just take two more questions, maximum, because I, I see, look, the whole stomach of our crowd is missing. They've left. And we still have a wonderful performance coming up and she's been waiting. So just two more questions, is that okay? Okay, so there's one and there's another one. Hello, very good afternoon. It's my question to Mr. Mufraudik that you just said that, uh, for example, T-shirt from Pakistan just costs three euro or three dollar, and it's it's not very good to 
where, but is it possible that in Europe or in Holland there can be a law that such kind of uh, clothes cannot be imported in Holland or in Europe? And also you can see like example Action or other cheap shops, there are a lot of selling in Holland or in Europe. What is the reason then such kind of cheap product they are selling there? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, uh, um, as the lady said, um, I don't know what I do. I know your name. I don't know. Um, you said there was a, um, if you have a low income and you have uh, children, of course you try to be as um, economical as you can. So you try to buy uh, perhaps uh, uh, cheap clothes, and they are uh, available. Uh, widely available uh, in this country. Um, and therefore, I, th I thought the comparison um, is, uh, however, uh, said quite all right. If you're poor here, um, then you have to use um, the, um, the, the work of a poor woman, um, mostly, in, in uh, low-income uh, uh, countries, because you don't, have an, you don't have a choice. You have to buy this, because elsewhere you cannot buy clothes, and not enough for your children, uh, perhaps. So it's a very uh, difficult moral dilemma, I would say. Um, and this is not, uh, as we have uh, said before, and everybody here has said, this is not easy because it's a global entangled uh, thing, the clothing industry, the, the way we are looking uh, at this and the way it's working. So this is not easy to change, but if we try to um, not only ask these companies to change uh, their production, uh, their way of production, but um, uh, regulate this, then this should be at least a first step, in my opinion. Okay, so we'll try to regulate. There was one question here. I think that will be then our last question for tonight, so that we can, and, and there is of course the rest of your life to discuss, and tonight we'll still be here to discuss a little bit. Well, let's have this one first. If it's a short answer, we might be able to yes, entertain Maybe it's one. in line with the, with the previous questions. It's, uh, the, Address to Mrs. Dix as well. Uh, we were uh, talking about the responsibility of a consumer in this, um, but I have a strong feeling that uh, you, in a way, have a responsibility as well because okay. you have been elected to represent mm -hmm. us in making uh, legislation. Uh, could you name one idea for a law or, uh, yeah, to, to <laughs> help? regulate this problem. Well, I do... Very popular question. tonight. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, uh, yeah, my question is also, I think uh, you gave a very political answer and I wasn't expecting anything else. Uh, see, uh, there, yeah, because there, there are two different things. One is who is responsible for all this mess, yeah, right? And we all agree they are brands because they have the biggest stake and biggest money to make. But then who can do something about it, that's something totally different than who is responsible. Because if you go to brands and beg them, request them, push them, pull them, they will resist. Because it's their profits, it's their money, they will never. I mean, asking them to do something is like asking Taliban to be in charge of security. And you know what kind of security you will get. But I think the party which can really, really do something is the politics. And politics is, again, I'm sorry, I'm using this phrase, but you guys, but you are from the better party, so I'm not <laughs> directing my, my comments to you. Uh, because politics in general, they talk from both sides of their mouths. On one hand, you are sitting here and criticizing these companies, but you give tax relief to the same companies in billions and billions of euros. <laughs> billions of euros. We, we, we consume here finest quality chicken breast and drumsticks and export the rubbish as rubbish because then you don't pay taxes on it and you pay lower freight to Africa as rubbish and they eat this as a chicken and all chicken farms there are out of business because of that. So, I mean, and you very conveniently said it's a shared responsibility. If you say shared, it means no one is responsible. So the responsibility, I think, for doing something 
is really, really with the politics, and you guys have to be transparent, you have to be honest, you have to be focused, and you have to be determined to do something about it. Yeah. European Union? I mean, what has European Union done about immigrants in Hungary, in Baltic republics, in Italy? Talking, 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 nothing. So, okay, so what is your so question? My, my question is, <laughs> yeah, my question is, when is politics going to be honest, transparent and open and really do something instead of talking. Okay. <laughs> Tomorrow? Yeah, this is, this is an interesting question, of course, and this could take two hours to answer this, yeah. but I won't because I'm very interested in the performance uh, too, of course. Um, one thing, um, you, you said um, uh, Green uh, Left or Groen Links is the party that, um, uh, is the better party, that's the, the phrase that I have. Uh, <laughs> Which was music to your ears, of course. <laughs> Sorry. No, but I, of course I do agree. And, and the thing that you said about tax evasion, that's the one, also one of the things that we have in our uh, programs, of course, just to change that. Because this is one of the reasons that I said this is so entangled. All these kind of aspects are part of this problem that Sira uh, has um, uh, attacked in her country. Um, but that was not um, a way for me to evade the question because I do think that, um, of course, uh, politics are uh, responsible also that where we can change things or where we can regulate and in that uh, way change things, of course we have to do that. But I am not as sad or um, uh, sad about the European Union uh, or the European Parliament as you are uh, uh, or you have uh, said now because I do believe that when the European Parliament wants to change something and they want to regulate this for the entire of the Union for 500 million people that's of course better than 28 kinds of um, uh, 28 different ways to attack this. So I do have uh, confidence in the Union to change this system. Of course where we can do this on a national level of course we will. This is why I'm here. Yeah. Well, how is everybody feeling? Confused? Yeah. Confused. Okay, so I think this is good food for thought on a Tuesday night <laughs> before you go to bed, because it's getting late. But I want to try to summarize where we've been. So we started with a really beautiful call for a clean country which was inspired by Namibia, but I think it's something that we all want. We've been inspired by Zera, who's been doing excellent work in Pakistan, really in, with using all the powers she possibly can to organize people and, and a significant number of people to get their rights, to stand up for their own rights, to get other people to recognize that they have and should have those rights, and is here, of course, to rally us along with her fight. So we've been there and we've seen that it's very complex. I really appreciate that you've uh, told us really about the struggle without us having to see the uh, real horror of what is wrong because we know it's wrong. I think it would be, there is something sick about needing to know the nitty gritty details of what is wrong when we know it is wrong. We are, that's why you're here, you know it's wrong. So I appreciate that you've done this here with a lot of respect, with a lot of inspiration, and you've represented people that you fight for. And I, I really appreciate that, I'm deeply touched. I hope you are also as well. I also would like to, uh, 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 Seika, did I say your name right? You can correct Shika. me. Shika, thank you. Shika, Shika in my, in my language is money. Um, uh, Shika is, um, has also given us a lot of insights into the complexity. I think that ties in very well in what Jenny has told us and what she uh, read to us up front is really, it's, we all, a lot of our questions maybe, we're looking for how can we do this? So who's the right producer? Okay, so you, the government are responsible. Who else should be responsible? But it's complex because we are all in a capitalist system, right? So I think uh, this night has really shown us this shadow side of, of the capitalist system where it might look like you can make maximum profits, but at what expense? You know, we are all exploiting someone in, in one way or another. If it's not our clothes, it's indeed our chicken, or it's you know, all sorts of things that we do to, to earn a little bit more, and that's what we enjoy here. So I, I would like to thank you also for giving us insight into the complexity of 
the system. It's not about making just that one right choice, but it's a set of right choices. It's a set of. It's really about orchestration of a set of things that will really lead to impactful, deep uh, uh, change. Um, I would like to thank you for taking us along, also in a very respectful way. Uh, uh, to see really based on the testimonials that you've seen how difficult and rather absurd it is to to be working in a garment uh, factory for such low wages and for instance not be able to take a break to pee, to take a sweet pee as my cousin would call it. I would like to thank you uh, Mrs. Dix, you've gotten so many questions here. Thank you for being a politician. Politicians uh, take a lot of uh, uh, bullets from the public because we expect a lot from you. Um, I hope you've heard a lot of things here that inspire you and your party and that you will really take this issue seriously and uh, thank you also for sharing with us your experience and, and your inspiration and I'd like to thank you uh, the clean clothes campaign for your workshop I think that was really insightful I think uh, we've taken pictures used hashtags used that at sign used our Twitter if you haven't done it you're going to do it we started we're not done we are not done we have so much work to do and I think the key of it really uh, goes back to Sarah which is solidarity so get informed take the time to get informed if you really care there's no quick fix Take the time, get informed, get organized, join somebody, something, a movement, create a movement, and, and let's, uh, let's do something about this, because it's not just our clothes, but we can start with our clothes. Um, thank you all very much for your patience and for still being here, and I would like to give the floor to Shishani Franks to give us some more fire for the movement that we're creating together. Am I on? Yes. Thank you, Ama, also for the lovely presentation. Um, I would like to end the evening with a quote that I found very beautiful by Oscar Wilde. And I hope I'm saying it correctly, but it's, um, many people know the price of things, but not the value. And I think in this whole chain, it's about uh, seeing value differently. My life has a value apparently more than somebody who's in Bangladesh or in Pakistan. So I think the moment that we realize this deeply, really feel this, uh, and take away the divides um, is when we can start changing something. We see it all around the world with all the leaders we have uh, representing us now and, and crazy things happening in Chechnya with the LGBTI community, right-wing politics, name it. It's because we're creating these divides between people. So um, there was a lovely picture. I love my name, though, but there was another beautiful picture that really touched me tonight. It was a, a young lady sitting behind uh, the sewing machine. Could we maybe project that one? for this song, because I think it has more depth than just seeing my name there. Yeah. This one is called Minority. You got rules telling me what to do But is there anybody checking
makes it easy We need to realize whether Where the true problem lies It ain't who you are But the size of your mind Can you see with your heart And the past preconceptions Can you see my soul Past the labeling section This is who I am Gonna stand up proud Won't let no Thank you. Thank you very much once again, Shishani. Thank you all for being here. Thank you the organizers, Mama Cash, Clean Clothes Campaign, National Postcode Loterij de Bali for hosting us. And have a very good night. <laughs>